everybody. Before I get started, I have to correct something from this morning. Um, when John Solomon was up here and Steve Hantler mentioned that we had sent 82,000 letters to Speaker Ryan and boxes stacked to the ceiling, um, it was actually over 500,000 letters. So I told Steve that I would correct him during my panel and make sure that you all knew the right number because it is a significant difference and it looked significantly different in the pictures. So, well, thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for joining the panel. We're going to be talking about healthcare, uh, healthcare for you today. I want to start with just a short video explaining what healthcare for you is, um, which is a policy framework that Job Creators Network Foundation and Physicians Reform developed a few years ago, and it was really our answer to Bernie Sanders' uh, Medicare for All. So let's kick that off. freedoms that we used to have as doctors and patients have been eroded over the years. We have a healthcare system that no longer works for the patient, but actually works for the outside players. The more people that get between the doctor and the patient, the less choice, the less control the doctor and the patient have over the care the doctor's going to give or the patient's going to receive. Obamacare has not lived up to any of the promises. Medicare for all is simply Obamacare on steroids. If Medicare for all should pass, I won't be able to get into my doctor on time, and I won't get the procedures I need. And to me, that's life and death. The healthcare system has really kind of forgotten about the American people. Everyone needs the ability to customize a plan for them. Healthcare for you. Healthcare for you. A healthcare plan for the people, by the people. Gaining tremendous momentum at the grassroots level. What we want to do is fix what's wrong with the current healthcare system and make it better for all Americans so that there's more choice, more competition, and it's more affordable. We need to make a system that puts the decision making back in the hands of patients and their doctors. Personalized health care instead of a one size fits all that would unleash a flood of new insurance options. Former Speaker Newt Gingrich has endorsed the plan. Former HHS Secretary Tom Price has endorsed the plan. For the first time ever, Job Creators Network Foundation has actually gone to people, thousands of voters, and said, what do you want to see in your health coverage plan? When you start taking out the complexity of the system, things get less expensive because it's from me to my doctor and my doctor back to me. That's it. There's no one else there. Do you want a government-run system that's top-down, bureaucratic, very expensive, with no choice? Or do you want health care for you that's personalized, that puts you in charge of not only your health care decisions, but your health care dollars? I'm going to show you a quick headline from about 10 years ago in the Wall Street Journal is titled, States Look Beyond Washington on Health. It's highlighting the runaway health care costs that burden small business and ordinary Americans. That was 10 years ago, February of 2010. Um, Obamacare passed the very next month. It did absolutely nothing to rein in costs for every do everyday ordinary Americans or our small businesses. It made a broken system even more broken. Um, and according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, the average family health care premium at a small business in 2023 was over $23,000. So it definitely didn't help to rein in any costs at all. And it also didn't really increase access. A lot of people have more insurance cards in their wallets now, but they don't necessarily have access to health care. They just have an insurance card. So those are some of the issues that we, we will definitely talk about. Um, Free market healthcare is one idea, like healthcare for you that we just talked about, that I just showed in the video, that would help drive down um, costs. Uh, Mr. Secretary Acosta, you worked on association healthcare plans um, when you were in the Trump administrations. Those are another idea. Dr. Gray, we're gonna talk about your uh, plan that you're working on right now. But when you think about healthcare and the places where free market is injected, and, um, and how it can drive down costs. I'll just give you a couple of quick examples. LASIK eye surgery came out about 20 years ago. The cost has decreased about 50% in those 20 years and the procedure's only gotten better. It's because of competitive forces. 
Um, orthodon orthodontia, uh, how many of you have children that you've put in braces? It's a tremendous cost. If you've ever shopped with or orthodontists, you will find varying costs everywhere on the cost of orthodontia. Again, those are free market, health, free market forces injected into healthcare, which is very helpful. The current system also does not incentivize patients to actually shop for better prices because there's no price transparency. The only thing that Americans care about right now and that they're incentivized to decrease is their own costs because they, they only care about their insurance premiums and meeting their deductibles. That's it. They don't care <coughs> about the cost of the service because they don't know how to find out about it. So those are the, some of the uh, forces that if we can inject into our healthcare system, we can help drive down some of those costs. Um, and lastly, we just need to figure out how to package it so that the American people understand it and they see it as a vision, kind of like what we talked about this morning with the Great Opportunity Project is creating a vision for Americans to buy into and support and want to be part of. So let's get started. Dr. Gray, JCNF developed Healthcare for You with your nonprofit, Physicians for Reform. Can you explain the genesis of Healthcare for You? And also, you work as a full-time doctor on the front lines. Tell us what that would mean for your patients. Lane, thank you so much for <clears throat> putting all this uh, all together. It's been an absolutely spectacular event, and it's tough following Newt Gingrich. So I used to do public speaking with C.L. Bryant, and our rule was I would always speak first, and he'd speak second. But, <laughs> so thank you so much. Let me start with your second question first. In terms of what this means for patients, um, I remember taking care of a woman some time ago, and I'm a hospitalist, and the question for me is to come down and look at her foot. She had a diabetic foot ulcer, peripheral vascular disease. So I saw her and I thought, you know, she needs treatment, but we can start some oral antibiotics and have her follow up in the outpatient setting. So we took care of her, she went home. I was called back to the ER about a month later. It's the same woman, same problem, but I looked at her foot. I thought, holy smokes, she might lose her foot. So we admitted her, got her to surgery, IV antibiotics, and, and I asked her what had happened since that first visit. She said, my deductibles are so high, I couldn't get care. So there's never follow-up that she needed. So it kind of brings me to healthcare for you, and one of my favorite quotes is Essequam videri. It's Latin for to be, not to seem to be. Our fight is to fix healthcare, not to seem to fix healthcare. So I'll spend a minute or two on some of the backstory in terms of how healthcare for you came to be. My organization was doing some research. I want to say a special thanks to Nancy Schultz. So we had met with um, Mark Meadows when he was still sharing the Freedom Caucus and then pitched the idea of a, uh, a healthcare contract with America. It's kind of interesting to say after we just heard from the, the original author of that. But he said, write a one-page plan for Trump and um, I'll take it over. So we did that, met with uh, Chip Roy and he said, do market research before launching that campaign. So we retained a, a firm from DC and did extensive market research, but the first thing we did was take those 10 policy points, mm -hmm. and Nancy and I worked extensively to frame it in terms of patient language. So once patients understood what we were trying to do, it was amazing what we found in our research. So just to show you a few numbers, we could shift the Hispanic vote from 44% support to 58% support, a 14-point swing. Uh, Middle-aged women, 52 to 63. African-Americans, 59 to 70% support. Democrats even moved from 47 to 57. And hourly wage earners went from 55 to 65% support. Now, when you average in conservatives and Republicans, healthcare for you, personalized health care, where they're in control, you cut out the middle, middlemen, drop the cost by about 50%, has about 70 to 72% support. Again, back to what Newt would encourage us to do, is find issues that have 70, 80, 90% of public support with the right language, with the right framework. That's health care. And two take-home points is not only are patients open to health care for you, patient-centered health care, they're hungry for it. And two, Republicans not only can run on health care, they can win with it. 
And what was significant about healthcare for you and the research that was done is this was market research. It wasn't just <coughs> a traditional polling. We went to about 25,000 Democrats, independents, um, and Republicans and asked them what they wanted to see in a healthcare plan. So it was very different from just polling, but we went into doing actual market research. So it, the, the results were significant and it really told us what the American people wanted. Yeah, from our end, we got input from about 15,000 Americans. We then used a computerized modeling. We modeled all 213 million registered voters. We showed we can shift the centrist vote by two to six percent in virtually every congressional district in the country. Absolutely, absolutely. Secretary Price, you've been in this, this area for a long time in Congress, as Secretary for Health and Human Services as well. Why isn't the problem getting solved? What's, what's the biggest barrier to market-based reforms along the lines of health care for you? And how powerful is that health care lobbying machine? Oh, thanks, Elaine. Thanks for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, so you got a logical, um, positive, uh, real solution, and it doesn't get adopted by Washington. So you never heard of that, right? Uh, <laughs> truly uh, uh, challenging. But it's important to be able to try to address the issue of why it hasn't been, been uh, adopted. Um, and my sense is that, that uh, um, we always talk about the health care system. And in fact, uh, we don't have a health care system. We have health care systems. Uh, so we've got Medicare for seniors and Medicaid for folks at the lower end of the economic spectrum. We've got the ERISA plans, the self-insured plans, the employer plans, the, where most of us get, get our health coverage. You've got Obamacare. Uh, you've got the uh, Veterans Administration. You've got TRICARE. You've got uh, Indian Health Service. On and on and on. And all of these systems have their own rules and regulations and requirements of the folks trying to provide the care and we wonder why it doesn't work, right? So it, it, because it, it's, uh, uh, it's an absolute cluster. And it looks like a cluster because it is a cluster. Uh, but the, the, the important thing to appreciate is that when somebody puts forth a solution, um, it usually is nibbling at the margins. Um, what this screams out for is fundamental reform, fundamental solutions like uh, he healthcare for you. Um, and, and when you nibble at the margins, what you do is tend to glom on. You add something on to this program or that program, or you add somebody that's covered, um, or you change the way that their coverage works. Um, and so you're never really fixing anything. You're just, you're just confounding or making the, uh, the system more and more complicated, which is actually one of the reasons that it becomes that much more difficult to, to, to find uh, a solution. Because the thing gets so large, and that's where we are right now with a system, a, a health arena that is so massive and so large. Um, one of the other reasons that we haven't been able to get it solved, and, and, and Rich could speak likely more to this, but my experience is that it's about uh, 20 to 25 percent of the individuals, the policymakers in DC right now, um, who are charged with, with coming up with, with solutions, who actually believe that the government ought to be in charge. Right. Um, that if they're not self-avowed socialists, they act that way and they vote that way. Um, and, and, and so their belief isn't that, that patients ought to be in charge or that uh, physicians and their patients ought to be in charge, it's that the government ought to be in charge. They firmly believe, they sincerely believe um, that, that the government can make better decisions about your health care for you and for your family than you can. Um, and, and, and so you're up against a, a huge juggernaut just from, from, from the get-go. Um, and so you mentioned the lobbying uh, uh, aspect, the health care uh, lobbying, and it is massive. There, there, there's no doubt about it. Um, but it's not monolithic. So every actor in the health, health arena, uh, in the health space, every one of them has, has a lobbyist working for them. So whether it's the hospitals or the insurers or the docs or the nurses, or the other providers, uh, or, the, or pharmacy, uh, or medical device companies. Um, and that's not even including all of the patient advocacy groups. There's a patient advocacy group for every single disease known to man. Um, and they all come to DC, and they rarely, if ever, are saying the same thing. So for policymakers, it becomes really simple for uh, the folks in, in Congress, and in, the, in the House, and in the Senate to say, well, you all can't even get your act together. You can't even decide what it is that you want. So I'm just going to sit back and wait. 
and I'll, I'll make a decision at the very last moment and never try to push out those forward positive solutions that are actually out there. So uh, fundamental solutions are what are necessary. Healthcare for you is, 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 has incorporated many of those fundamental solutions and making certain that we're talking about, yes, market-based, free market-based, but that means patient-centered healthcare, not government-centered healthcare. Absolutely. Secretary Acosta, can you explain the steps that the Trump administration took to reform healthcare in a more personalized direction? You know, association healthcare plans, short-term plans, price transparency. We worked with you and your secretary um, on association healthcare plans. Our small business owners told us that that would have been a, a game changer for them as far as affordability and being able to offer healthcare to their, to their employees. Talk a little bit about those. Thank you, Elaine. Um, and, and first, let me say um, I worked very closely with JCN around the association healthcare plans, making it known to small businesses. And JCN was so, so helpful at the ground level in, in getting the word out because we actually wrote a rule for association healthcare plans. Uh, the rule right away reduced the cost of healthcare for small businesses by about 30%. In the first three months, about four to 500,000 lives joined association healthcare plans. And it was going great until California and New York and Washington State brought a lawsuit. And the judge said, let's block this until it's litigated. And then the Biden administration came along and said, we don't want this, and withdrew the rule. So having, having given the conclusion, let me take a, a step back and explain what association healthcare plans are about. Uh, so when Obamacare was passed, uh, large corporations came to Washington and they said, we can't afford this. This is far too expensive. And they brought their lobbyists and they said, we can't afford this, this is too expensive. And so Obamacare reinforced um, a, a pre-existing uh, rule that said that there are really two markets for healthcare. Uh, those companies that have more than 50 employees play by one set of rules, and the smaller companies that has less than 50 employees play by a different set of rules. And you would think that the set of rules for the large companies are more stringent, higher standards. No, no, no. Uh, the large companies have less standards and more flexibility because their lobbyists said we can't afford it. And it's the small businesses that have the more expensive, more stringent set of requirements which in my opinion is backward, right? Um, but, but as a result, you have the large group and the small group market, and the small group market where small businesses reside is about 30 to 40% more expensive. And so the idea of an association healthcare plan, and, and the reason this is a labor issue is because the Department of Labor regulates employer benefits, hence employer provided healthcare, is the law around employer benefits says that, literally it says, an association of employers can act as an employer to provide benefits. And so we said, great, a chamber of commerce is an association of employers. The association of realtors is an association of employers. So let's let them act as the employer to provide benefits. So for example, the Las Vegas chamber could say, we're gonna provide healthcare benefits for all our members' employees the, the employers will pay a fee to the chamber per, per employee, and the chamber can then go out and provide, kind of like the federal government. If you join the federal government, you have a choice of 15, 20 different healthcare plans. Well, the chamber could then say, here are 15 different healthcare plans. You choose. You choose what's right for your family, different pricings, different co-pays, and start to create a market. But at the same time, because they're now representing hundreds of small businesses, they can create scale, they can negotiate against the insurance company, and most importantly, because if you have 100 businesses times 50, you now have you know, 5,000 uh, members, you can enter the large group market and get all the benefits and flexibility of that large group market. And actually, uh, the Las Vegas Chamber was one of the, the chambers of commerce that picked it up right away. Um, you know, we were talking to some of the Florida chambers of commerce for doing this. Um, and for the Chambers of Commerce, this was a game changer because they were bringing actual benefits to their members, and at the same time, they were saving their members a lot of money. 
30% less, to use the, the Las Vegas example, with thousands and thousands of lives covered. Um, you know, there, there's a second part of this that, that I thought was a game changer. There's so many individuals out there that are afraid to change jobs because what's gonna happen to my healthcare? Will I lose my healthcare? But the beauty of association healthcare plans is if you go from employer one to employer two, and they're both part of the chamber, or from realtor one to realtor two, and they're both part of the association of realtors, you can carry your healthcare with you. And so it brings portability and it creates a real market. It empowers workers to say to their employer, you need to pay me more or I'm gonna walk, right? Because if we believe in the free market, we also need to believe in, in, in employees having the ability to negotiate their wage without the barrier of losing their health care. Um, so we wrote the rule, uh, it was passed, um, and then there was immediate pushback. This is a bad idea. And so the Washington Post came and said it's a bad idea. And you know, this was my response to them. You know, all we're saying is that the Association of Independent Journalists can play by the same rules as the Washington Post. So are you really saying that the Washington Post provided health care and the rules of Washington Post follows are bad? And they're like, yes, but, but that shouldn't apply to, to small group market. And my question is why, right? And then behind the scenes, what everyone would say is the problem with association health care plans is that they're so much less expensive. You're providing the same coverage, but for so much less because you can negotiate against the insurers because of the scale that you're taking people away from the Obama exchanges. And so what re what's really going on here is liberals do not want a solution because they want to drive people into the exchanges and make Obamacare the healthcare solution for everyone. And so there are solutions. Prices can be dropped. Association health plans are one of them but the liberals are trying to block them in every possible way because solutions means that we're not gonna have socialized medicine and that's what they want. Uh, price transparency, the same point. Um, you can't have a market if you don't have prices, right? No, one, no one's gonna go and, and, and buy clothes or groceries if you don't see a price and actually price compare. Yet in healthcare, we don't have prices and honestly, a lot of us don't care because we're not paying for it, right? And so at least directly, the third, the, the third party payer system undermines the free market, short-term limited duration, another game-changing rule that we put into place. All of this being, has been undone now by the Biden administration. Yes, and that whole price transparency, like I was saying, nobody's incentivized to actually look for better uh, costs in terms of the services that they're getting patients because we only care about those two things, our premium sure. costs and our deductibles. Um, and like I said, nobody can find the price of anything anyway. Yeah. There's, there's nowhere to find it, so. Congressman McCormick, you joined our new podcast just a few weeks ago, Main Street Matters, and we had a great conversation on healthcare. Can you tell <coughs> us what's happening on Capitol Hill to fix our broken healthcare system? I know House Republicans have coalesced behind a healthcare bill reform bill called Lower Costs, More Transparency Act. Can you explain how that bill would help reduce the outrageous costs facing small businesses and ordinary Americans? Well, before we describe what we're doing to Saul, let me tell you all the things that are getting in the way of that. Uh, <laughs> when you have more bills than you have days of the year, matter of fact, twice as many bills as you have days of the year, 734 bills are proposed for health care this year alone. Uh, that's from Congress. Do the math on that one. Think about how impossible that is, how over, uh, just from the doctor's caucus alone, you have, I believe, 128 bills on health care. Uh, and I went through this with my legislative aide, and, and we literally went through everyone. I think we found less than 10 that actually had any real impact. But we'll waste all of our time coming up with word salad to say that, look, I did something. Thanks. I, I'm your congressman. I'm here to help. And, and this is the problem with Congress. We have a Secretary of Health and Human Services. I'll name him, Becerris, who's a lawyer, not a very good one because he's lost his first four lawsuits, um, <laughs> where he's been sued for going against the very spirit of a bipartisan law on solving a real problem in America uh, where you get surprise billing. And, and where he's representing basically space, special interests on purpose 
jipping the, the Americans out of, out of their God-given right to, to have access to health care without people getting in the way. And, and all the regulation we burden people have increased the cost of health care. And we don't even know where the money goes. We spend more in America on health care than anybody by far per capita or overall. It doesn't really matter. The amount we spend on health care in America is $4.5 trillion per year. Do the math on that. That's the same size as the GDP of the third largest GDP in the world, which is the equivalent of Japan or Germany, far greater than what we, they spend in the entire economy uh, of India. Think about that. And, and we have a half a trillion dollars of waste in administrative costs, half a trillion in waste in just administrative costs per year in the healthcare system, and yet we're so sidetracked by all these different bills that really don't do anything. What this does, what the Transparency Act does, basically say, here's where the money goes. It's not going to doctors. Doctors took, on average, about a 2.8% pay cut last year alone during an 8% inflationary year. If you're an ER doctor, you probably lost 25% of your income last year alone. Thank you for treating COVID. Here's your pay cut. <laughs> Meanwhile, your health insurance premiums went up by about 7% last year alone. By the end of the year, it's probably going to be about 10%. And that's, that's just one year. It's the fastest inflationary cost to all Americans, both in taxes and also as a business. It is the biggest cost we spend in American government. 26% of every dollar is spent on health care. 26% of your entire government cost is health care. The second leading cost to business owners, by the way, and fastest growing. What this does is tell us where the money's going. It's not going to doctors. Patients are paying more, so where's the money going? We're spending plenty on health care. It's going to special interests. That's why we have so many bills, because each special interest group wants a bill introduced. <laughs> That's why we have 734 bills. We need to know where that money goes. We know where it goes. Insurance companies have made eight record straight quarters of profit. PBMs, massively killing it. They could put a million dollars in every politician's pocket and have leftover. That's why they're so powerful. That's what we're fighting against. That's why this is so important. This conversation, these bills, to make that exposed, trans Shine the light on it. Let's see where it goes, and then let the American people weigh in. Exactly. When you have such a big bureaucratic system, the only way, complex system, the only way to remove costs is to remove the complexity of it and simplify it. Um, just like the video said, it's from me to my doctor and my doctor back to me. It's, it doesn't get more simple than that, right? Amen. Yeah. Um, Dr. Gray, in addition to working with free market advocates in Washington, you've also launched a market-based solution called Project Moonshot. What is Project Moonshot? What does it mean for small business owners who uh, struggle to recruit and retain high-quality employees? Yeah, after spending, boy, goodness, I think I gave my first talk on healthcare back in 1998. So and I spent a, a decade and a half up in D.C., and that's essential work. But after uh, Biden moved into the White House, I was looking at what can we do to fix health care that doesn't involve legislation from Washington. So two things happened at that time. I read a book called uh, The Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen. The business people out there might know it. And there's a lot of principles in that book. It's about uh, disruptive innovation. My take home point from that, that book is health care is ripe for disruptive innovation from the outside. I'd love to spend 20 minutes on it, but I'll cut myself off there. <laughs> Second thing I was doing at the time, I was hosting National Physician uh, Innovator Leader Conference calls. There's a national <coughs> call, probably between 20 and 50 docs would, would hop on the call. And I started to interview the physician innovators in person after person after person of these innovators, when they engaged patients directly, cut out all the middlemen, dropped the cost of caring for their patient by 40, 50, 60, sometimes 70%. And one physician gave an example with a 95% uh, cut in, in cost to care for their patient. So I have uh, got to know these uh, physicians pretty well. We brought Nancy Schultz and myself, along with John, John Fleming, previous uh, Deputy Chief of Staff, who's also a physician, brought them to, to D.C. And there we met uh, in, for a day and a half, launched what I had called Project Moonshot. I don't know if we have that, that graphic, but essentially what I had done 
was took health care, and you can see the uh, patient on the right, surrounded by six what I call silos, primary care, specialty care, labs and imaging, uh, surgeries, uh, hospital care. And um, I identified thought leaders in each of those silos. And what was unique about each of them is they engaged the patient directly with the cash-based system. And then the bottom left, those two circles, but you also have to cover large medical expenses. That can be done through a captive model. It can be done through medical cost sharing. And uh, what was missing was the interconnectivity, the communications hub, because each of these practices, even though there are thousands of physicians doing this, they couldn't share patients. They couldn't act as an actual system. So then I spent uh, another year and a half and identified uh, a group that was building this communications hub. So we're actually, instead of trying to fix healthcare through Washington, we're actually building and outcompeting an alternative free market, fully transparent cash-based system that can care for patients. And the, what it means for small business owners is if we can cut their second largest line item by on the order of 50%, that gives small, medium businessmen and individuals cash to either increase wages, because uh, salary increases have been essentially flat for a decade. All those what should have been wage increases have gone to health benefits. So it will let them innovate and compete on the international market. So. And we're launching a pilot project with Job Payers Network here in Florida, and that should start uh, in January. So yes. any businessmen out there that would like to be part of this, I'd love to talk to you. Well, that's a, great, that's a great place to start is with the small business owners. There's 30 million small business owners out there, and if we can build momentum on these free market alternatives like what, what Dr. Gray is doing, and we start moving small business owners and their employees into a more... Uh, free market-based system, we grow that system and, and we, we move away from this drift towards a socialistic healthcare system. So that's the point of all of this. So yes, small business owners, we would love to talk to you more about your healthcare um, options. Congressman uh, McCormick, you are also a practicing doctor. Um, interesting, we have uh, three, three healthcare doctors <laughs> on the panel and one lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you are also a practicing doctor. Can you explain how being on the front lines of healthcare, the healthcare cost crisis, helps you educate Congress on legislative solutions? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with the fact that I, I start off life as a Marine. So I'm a Marine, I'm an ER doc, so I can kill you and bring you back to life. <laughs> I used to think I was pretty popular, you know, you're a youth minister. Marine, doctor, then you join politics and you realize you're about equal with telemarketers, right. slightly more popular than COVID. Um, but in, in Congress, one of the problems we have, we have 180 lawyers in Congress and about 14 doctors. Uh, if we're going to build a consensus towards health care, the American people have to support us. They, they have to understand what's at stake here. Uh, we have a lot of confusion about what healthcare is really about, and people don't understand that transparency is the key right. to the future of medicine. They understand that doctors deliver the cheapest medicine, even aside from hospital systems. That when you start adding layers and layers upon a bureaucracy and regulation, trying to solve the problem, we only made it worse over and over again. And this is the problem with government in general. We keep on turning back to the government to solve the problems that government created. And that's the biggest part of growth that we keep on. This is why people now look at the government and, and how many people now say, well, the government defines what's moral, not God, right? Transgenderism, it's, it, that's a government decision whether it's moral or not. Medicine, it's not the doctors to get determine what, how you get treated. It's the government. They're the standard of care, right? It's not your business owners that get determine who you hire, who you fire, when you're open. It's the government because they're the standard. They become all powerful, even in their own mind. Even some Republicans, and this is driving me crazy, are starting to wield the government like a sword, just like the Democrats do, because winner takes all. We've forgotten our God-given rights. We've forgotten that our government was designed to empower the people over the government. And this is what we're missing. When we talk about designing health care into the future, giving us the power to decide gives us the cheapest model of medicine there is. And getting the government out of the way gets rid of that half trillion dollar of waste right off the bat. 
and allows us access to doctors who care the most about patients of anybody involved in this equation and gets it out, gets it from in between that, that scenario that disrupts good health care. And I think that's the conversation we should be having. Absolutely. And, and so many doctors now are not in private practice anymore. They actually work for big hospital systems. And so they end up actually just having to be more beholden to the hospitals and the insurance companies than to the patients. And so if we can get that bureaucracy, um, I say in literal sense, get the bureaucrats out of the exam room and bring that decision back with, to the doctor and the patient, um, again, that removing the complexity is removing costs and putting patients and doctors back in charge of healthcare. And I'd be remiss not to mention my wife's an oncologist. And this whole idea that the pre-approval process is going to be run by administrators and tell doctors what's right for your patient drives her crazy. It gives worse patient outcomes, more expensive health care ultimately, delayed health care, frustrates patients both insured and also government insured. It's the worst possible situation there is. Let doctors do their job. I, I want to define one thing for you. Um, you said that um, Congress is always working to fix the problems in health care that they have caused. At JCN, we call that arsonist firemen. <laughs> We come, in, we come in contact with that term a lot. All the time. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> Dr. Price, um, doctors are also major victims of the current system. How would a more personalized healthcare system that removes politicians and bureaucrats from the system um, help, uh, in, from the exam room, help them? Yeah, this is really important because the folks that are providing your care, the the guy or the gal that's seeing you, um, you never know what their mindset is at this point because you never know what kind of incentives they're being confronted with. You don't know, uh, you, you, you mentioned that, that uh, so many docs are now employed. Um, uh, I'm a dinosaur and I know that, but a generation or, or, or generation a half ago, uh, there's, a, there's a, 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 a survey that's done of graduating medical students every year and it's been done for 50 or 60 years. And, and uh, 30, 40 years ago, um, they ask a question, what is, to, to the medical students, graduating medical students, what's your ideal employment situation? What's your ideal working situation uh, in, in your life that you would see? And it was about 70 or 80 percent who said they wanted to run their own business. Basically, they wanted to run their own office. They wanted to take care of patients in their own office. And now that's completely flipped. So it's about 75 or 80 percent of graduating medical students whose self-described ideal situation is to be an employed doctor is to work for somebody else. And so we ought not scratch our head and wonder why we've gotten to the, to the situation where, where we are right now. The sad part of that is that, that, that um, you, you're just not certain who your doctor is working for. And so when your doctor, he or she tells you that they think that, that, that you ought to have X test or that test or this procedure or that procedure or this medication or that medication, you're not sure whether they're looking out for your best interests or whether they're looking out for the best interest of the individual that's signing their paycheck. And, and you think about that as a patient, and that ought to be terribly frightening. But think about that as a doc, mm -hmm. that you trained over for years and years to take care of patients. And now you know, you may not admit it to your, to your patients, but now you know in the back of your mind that somebody's telling you what to do. I used to, I, I, I try to talk to medical students and residents all the time about the systems that we have and, and, and why it's incredibly important that patients and families and doctors are making medical decisions and nobody else. And even with folks at the University of Colorado Medical School, I know there's some folks from Colorado here, who aren't necessarily the most conservative kids on the face of the earth, um, but when I would talk to them about all the work that they had done, the undergraduate work that they had done, the medical school work, as they're looking toward to their, to their residency, do you want to do all this work and then have somebody tell you what to do? And, and, and you don't get any, any medical student to agree with that, that somebody else ought to be telling them what to do. And that's incredibly important because the fundamental principle of what healthcare for you is all about and what we all ought to be echoing out there is that from healthcare decision standpoint, patients and families and docs ought to be making those medical decisions and nobody else. It ought not be insurance companies, it ought not be hospitals or health systems or heaven forbid the government. So there's a fundamental principle that we can articulate and ought to be articulating and I think it can carry the day. Well, physicians who are self-employed and have their own practices have an interesting point of view and this is why I've enjoyed working with our physicians in our healthcare reform work. 
is because they're not just physicians on the front line trying to treat patients right. and fighting this bureaucratic uh, pre-approval process and everything with the insurance companies. They're also small business owners. So guess what they're dealing with, people? Regulations, high taxes, employment problems, health, high health care costs. They've got sort of a double whammy hitting them. Right. Um, and so they've been so interesting to work with because when I talk to them about any issue, they can talk on both sides mm -hmm. of it. And it's, they've just been such great spokespeople um, to talk about uh, many of these issues. So um, it's been great. Um, Secretary Acosta, you are well positioned to explain the consequences of the current system on business and employees. Can you describe the consequences to paychecks uh, and businesses of today's high price system and explain how association health plans, which you helped explain, expand and we talked about earlier during your tenure, can help reduce those costs? So uh, certainly, and you know, you've, we've already heard about the, the issues with the healthcare system and possible fixes, but I wanna put this in a larger context. In, um, and I wanna tie it to the economy. In 2000, um, about 70% of working age Americans wanted to work. They were either working or looking for a job, right? And we don't talk, it's called the labor force participation rate, and we don't talk about that enough. We focus on the unemployment rate, but that ignores all those Americans that are no longer looking for a job and no longer want to work. So about 70% of adult aged Americans were working. Um, by 2016, that figure had fallen to 62%, an eight percentage point decline. That is like an eight percentage point decrease in our gross domestic product. That's like an eight percentage point recession that we had. Now, in part, it's because Congress um, was enacting more benefits, and the benefit cliffs meant that folks looked and said, we're getting this money from the government, why should we work? Um, but in part, it's because of wages because folks want to keep up with inflation, inflation's getting higher and higher, and they want businesses to pay more. But businesses are saying, we can't pay more, we can't afford it, and here's why. So I looked up the data um, just this morning. Um, the last figures from September, uh, the average individual made $43 per hour. Now, that $43 per hour, 15 were benefits that that individual never saw in their paycheck. That's what the employer was paying for the right to employ an individual. Now, if you look at just the small business market, right, which tends to be lower wages, you're talking about $30 per hour, of which almost $11 per hour are benefits. And so here's a question. What would it mean to take those $11 per hour of benefits, throw it in the paycheck, tell individuals, Here's your money, it's your money, you earned it. You get to choose what you wanna do. And all of a sudden, businesses, without actually spending more, can increase everyone's salary by 11 to $13 per hour on average. Right, this is the impact that healthcare is having because it's putting this burden on employers to purchase something that might not be right for their employee. You know, in, in state, you know, when government puts a mandate on a state government, we call it a hidden mandate um, or an unfunded mandate. What we don't realize is that the federal government is putting a massive unfunded mandate on businesses, right? And it's, it's called healthcare. And that unfunded mandate is probably the largest unfunded mandate the federal government imposes. And it's causing a problem for small businesses, but it's causing a bigger problem for our society because a country, by 2030, the Department of Labor projects that less than 60% of working age Americans will be engaged in the workforce. A country where 70% of Americans work and pay taxes versus a country where only 60% of Americans work and pay taxes is fundamentally different, right? And, and that's gonna affect not just healthcare, not just business, but it's gonna affect the way people interact with society, the way people view government, the way people view their dependence on government versus their reliance on themselves. And so this is a much bigger issue than just healthcare. And, and small businesses and businesses in general really are at the crux because they can't afford to raise wages because the government is putting this massive unfunded mandate that is about a third of the cost of employment about a third of what you pay for employees 
is this unfunded mandate. That's absolutely right. See how we're doing on time. I think that we have some time to actually um, do some questions in the audience, and I know we have some folks with microphones out there. Uh, let's see if I can see out there. Oh, I see one right there, right up front. Thank you very much, a great, great discussion. Um, I just have a quick question with all those physicians on the panel. I'm Andy Mangione with AMAC. Uh, you can't have a conversation about healthcare reform without addressing the middlemen in the prescription drug supply chain known as pharmacy benefit managers and the middlemen <coughs> in the hospital supply chain known as group purchasing organizations and how they drive up the cost of drugs and supplies. Would you please briefly tell this audience how they're protected by a safe harbor that allows for their anti-free market business practices and what it would reasonably take to repeal this safe harbor? Thank you. It's not on. Mine is on. You can have mine. It will be. They'll turn on. They'll turn on. Feels like the government. <laughs> so PBMs are recognized as probably the biggest problem right now in healthcare. Um, they literally soak up the profits. They represent a, a – they're integrated at every level of healthcare right now, and, and they literally design the unfair, non-transparent – amount of money that goes everywhere. That's why we want to expose that first. The first step, it's only a small step, but it's a, it's a larger part of exposing where the money's going is this Transparency Act that, that tells us where it is so we can lower costs. We have to expose it right now. There's no transparency. We, we fine hospitals in Georgia millions of dollars for not being transparent on how they do their billing. And, and we do the same thing with PBMs right now. We're starting to, to focus on them. The problem is they pay the fine instead of being transparent, because they know if we know where the money's going, we will stop it. Uh, it's funny, they target doctors over and over again as the problem, as if we are the bigger part of healthcare costs. We're not. And we are taking healthcare, we're, we're taking uh, compensation costs uh, every single year. Uh, PBMs, you, you, you've nailed it, and we know about the doctor's caucus, yet I told you that lobbying effort is as strong as any lobbying effort in government, period. They're one of the richest entities. When you take $4.5 trillion, that's an incredible amount of money that people are fighting over. So you have some of the most powerful lobbyist groups in the world, not just the United States, in the world, fighting for a piece of that money. And, and it's not just PBMs, by the way. Uh, but we see the, the pharmaceutical companies, the insurance companies. You, you look at how complex medicine is, and this is why most people in Congress will never understand it. You do have 14 doctors, but Think about how much it takes for a doctor to even understand PBMs, GPOs, pharmaceuticals, insurance companies, hospital systems, <laughs> intermediaries, and all the different specialties, plus all the patient advocacy groups. That's what makes up all the people that come to talk to you about healthcare. And then you're supposed to make a comprehensive decision on reform for healthcare in general. That's the problem right now is most people don't even know how to work their phones very well in Congress because they're too old and they don't understand. <laughs> Just being honest. <laughs> Hi, I'm sorry, I insulted some people in here in this room. <laughs> but, but they don't, literally, think about the people in, in the Senate and think about the average age and how they don't understand how the complexities of Bitcoin, let alone healthcare. And healthcare is a lot more uh, complex than that. And that's the problem with exposing that and actually getting to the root of, of how we can solve this. But it comes back to the people. Maybe if I can chop in on this. Yeah. Is on? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say a special thank you to, to AMAC, because several years ago, we actually did a, a short animated video on the middleman. And if people want to watch it, they can go to physiciansforform.org. There's a little animated video with a couple of guys with bags of gold. But in the healthcare supply chain, it's formed what's called a monopsony. It's a monopoly of the supply chain. The GPOs and the PBM siphon off approximately 200 to $250 billion a year of kickbacks. They essentially have control over what the market sells to the hospitals, pharmacies, and the, the general public. So the better, and I met with Mark Meadows on this, we had a two-page bill to reverse that 1987 uh, piece of legislation. But it got to President Trump, he loved it, he used it in his speech on, on uh, drug pricing. But then the lobby went in to Mitch McConnell, who went to Trump, said you can't attack them. 
$250 billion a year is too much money. I think, Alfredo, you had Bernie Marcus call me one night several, several years ago. And when I explained to Bernie Marcus it's a $250 billion a year problem, he said, I thought this is pretty funny, he said if it was only $25 billion a year, you know, we could tackle it. He said for $250 billion a year, we've got to come up with a, another strategy. The strategy is to use the market to outcompete the GPOs and PPMs. You can't give them the safe harbor. You've got to stop the safe harbor. Now, um, Firuz Danish Kerry from Ohio. Uh, I'm a surgeon, I'm a surgeon scientist, and I've had the pleasure of talking to some of your panelists here. Um, I was, uh, before healthcare, I was uh, political party agnostic. And as you could see now, ended, ended up here. And the reason <laughs> for this is, I think uh, this is an absolutely a Republican issue, and if we cannot uh, simplify our message uh, to the American people, we are going to lose this opportunity. So with all due respect, if you vote, if you survey people out of this audience, after they're walking out of this session, what is the solution for healthcare we are going to have? You're going to get about 125 answers. And I think we have to focus on the simplifications because everything you all said from uh, Congressman McCormick to Secretaries Costa, Price, and my friend CL, Dr. Gray, and yourself as the arsenic fireman. It is very true. But we need to bring the common threads together. And these are, let me start with data. I'm a scientist. We are spending twice as much as our, our European and Japanese counterparts. We are spending 13,500 per capita versus four to 6,000 for them. We are generating four and a half trillion dollar in healthcare. Half of it is a waste. 30, 30 years of research shows half of it is a waste. A big part of it administrative waste. A, a bigger part of it is basically services, surgeries, procedures that are done that do not deliver any health outcomes for people. The reason for this waste to continue is because there are systematic problems. Number one, 75 to 80 percent of the doctors have become employed of the systems, and their job has turned from being caregivers to generators and protectors of revenues for the hospitals. Number two, the insurance companies, the third party payer system, is paying for this waste because it is not their money. For two thirds of Americans, it's the employer's money. They're just increasing your premiums year after year. Because of the third party payer, individuals have lost their sensitivity to the total cost of care. All I care is how much are my deductible is and how much my copay is. I don't care if I'm paying for $5,000 for an MRI or a $500 for MRI, which exists. So my plea to the panel and to this distinguished group here is we must simplify our message for the healthcare. The buzzword is not a buzzword, it's a true solution, that it has to be a free market, person center, consumer center, because we all are consumers of healthcare, from the time we are born to the time we leave this earth. The simplification message will draw the public because actually going back to one of your comments, in 92% of Americans think that the healthcare is broken. And frankly, we don't have a healthcare, we have a sick care. We have system that delivers through 5,000 hospitals that they are financially driven to deliver a march. My plea to the, to the group, the distinguished group, is we need to simplify the message because the common thread that you all mentioned is there. Nevertheless, the complexity will frighten the voters and they will go away. And we have a winning uh, topic in our hands to make a winning in 2024. Um, let me take a swing at this, if I may. Um, <laughs> could, couldn't agree more. At everybody's spot is, is, a, uh, is a page on uh, healthcare for you. Um, and if you, if you can't find it, the, then the QR code takes, takes, you to the, uh, takes you to the website and you can look at healthcare for you. The reason that I mention that is because that was, was, was tested for the American people. More, more, uh, more surveyed uh, individuals on the issue of healthcare than any other time in the history of the country that, that, that we're aware of. And, it, and the solution that's simple actually gets folks all across the political spectrum, and it actually saves money at the, uh, at, at the end of the day. 
The tagline in, in, in one sentence is that patients and families and doctors ought to be making medical decisions and nobody else. And, and uh, if you all adopt that and you keep sharing that back home, then we have a chance to be able to win this. And as far as a, a simplified message for the American people to understand, um, so you don't walk out of here with you know, several hundred different messages on what they think healthcare is, I'll take you all back to eight o'clock this morning with the great opportunity yeah. party um, panel where Alfredo talked about the front of the Diet Coke can and selling a vision um, versus selling the back of the can and selling that ingredient statement. You're absolutely right on the message. We have to get better at, at messaging a vision for the American people to get behind. So I'll leave you all with that. Thank you so much for joining us for the Healthcare for You panel, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day.